And the whole idea about my Everest project is just trying to do it when it's, when it's the most uncomfortable and um, the coldest, the darkest, the windiest, and I'm doing it on a, a difficult route and I'm doing it solo. So it's kind of reverse psychology there in the approach. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, for a couple of winters there, I was logging onto a website every couple of minutes, every couple of hours. I was just checking again and again and again. And what I was looking at was Joost Kobush's progress up and down the West Ridge of Everest. Because on the on his website, he had a tracking device and it showed in a 3D model of how he was going up, 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 up a mountain and down, down, down a mountain. And it, why don't we talk about the few things, the quite a few things that made this Everest expedition different from the standard Everest expedition? Hmm. So, I mean, normally you are there when the weather is best, which is usually during springtime. Um, that's statistically end of May. That's when most people would summit Everest mm -hmm. just before the monsoon hits because the weather is the warmest, the friendliest. And the whole idea about my Everest project is just trying to do it when it's, when it's the most uncomfortable and... Um, the coldest, the darkest, the windiest, and I'm doing it on a, a difficult route and I'm doing it solo. So it's kind of reverse psychology there in the approach. <laughs> and we should mention no oxygen either. Yes, and no oxygen. Or no supplemental oxygen. So we're talking about a mountain that is undeniably difficult. We're talking about the worst time of year. We're talking about a specific route, which I do want to get into and no oxygen, and alone. So that's at least five things uh, stacked against you. I'm sure you've been asked this before, but I've got to ask it. Why would you make something as difficult as possible and basically uh, put all the chances against you as opposed to stacking the odds in your favor? Um, so to me, alpinism is a way of exploring. It's this journey into the unknown, where you try to, to go to places that you haven't seen before, where you haven't been. It's like, ideally, you're entering a certain wilderness um, and uh, you do maybe a first ascent, a new route or an unclimbed peak. And to me, the style I do Everest is just what I believe to, to be the purest approach. Um, it's, it's this kind of alpinism that I love because I'm curious. I'm curious about what awaits me up there. People don't really know what awaits you up there in the winter on that route because it hasn't been done. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm curious about what's around the next corner. There, there are not like many information about the route and so on. And then again, I'm curious about what I'm able to achieve as an athlete and ultimately, of course, as a human being. Because um, deep down, I know I I could do it in the normal season. So why even bother trying it? Um, I, I'm somehow, how do I say, not fascinated by doing something I know that I can do. So what would you define purity as? You said you wanted to do it as pure as possible. Uh, so what would be the most pure way of doing it? If, if nobody had ever climbed Everest before, that would be... I'm assuming a little bit more pure. Yeah, that would be the purest. Like I, I do enjoy, for example, climbing unclimbed peaks and, and, and stuff like that because you have to figure it all out on your own. Like nobody's going to tell you it's it's working. In fact, you don't even know if it's working because there's usually a good reason why something is unclimbed. So that's really <laughs> what I enjoy. It's this figuring out, this like trying to think of it, like think about it without having any um, preoccupied thoughts of it or like right now, of course, it's Everest. It has history and people have done it, but I still need to figure out a lot of things and I need to do things differently than, than they have been done previously because I'm doing it differently. So for the Everest fanatics out there, what specific route were you doing? So the route I'm approaching is actually partly done, first done by Americans. Um, and um, 
partly first done by a, a Yugoslavian expedition. Um, so I will approach the West Ridge and then finally enter into the Hornbein Couloir. Now, you could argue that the way I do the route is a unique combination because these different expeditions before me, they have all done it kind of differently than I did it. But in itself, I'm basically just putting some parts together to what I believe is a logical line. It's a line that follows natural features, that avoids certain objective risks. And that is actually possible for me as a solo climber in the winter, because normally you have to cross the Combo Icefall, which I do not cross. I'm still approaching from Nepal, but in the winter, this huge mass of ice um, is is kind of a, um, it's a very big obstacle. Is the Kumbu Icefall, which is, I understand, one of the most dangerous parts of climbing Everest, is that more or less active in the winter than the summer? I would argue it's less active because um, you have lower temperatures. But um, in the spring season, you have like a lot of aluminum ladders there and you have a few kilometers of rope fixed there. So you basically just clip into that rope, you follow that rope until you're, you're over it. In the winter, I would basically need to navigate huge crevasses, ice towers, and um, theoretically, I might even need to bring aluminum ladders myself. And still, I know from expeditions that have tried the normal route in winter that this stuff moves. In the spring season, it can move up to 1.8 meters per day, which is a lot. Crazy. Yeah. And um, in the winter, it still moves. And so it means ice can collapse on top of you, avalanches can be triggered, and your ladders can be broken and moved, and the route is, is changing. The mountain is not static. Have you done Everest by the normal route or one of the more normal routes? I have attempted Lhotse in 2015, mm -hmm. and so I've crossed the icefall in the normal season, but in 2015 there was this earthquake happening and an avalanche hit the base camp, so the expedition was um, coming to an early end. You are the person who recorded that amazing footage of uh, the, uh, the avalanche hitting base camp. Yeah, so basically in that morning, it was just like the ground was moving and I was super excited. It was an earthquake, strong one, and I never had been in an earthquake. And I thought, cool, it's an earthquake. And, you know, I'm, I'm a curious person, so I like yeah. to experience new things. So it was just like an amazing feeling. And what better place to be than in a base camp where you have only tents, nothing like no buildings can collapse and fall on you and so on. So. I felt super safe until I turned around and there was this gigantic avalanche just um, speeding towards me. It was so huge. I remember I was thinking, doesn't even make a difference if, if I'm running now. And uh, did it end up hitting you? To what, or to what extent did it hit you? I was kind of frozen a bit first, but then people started running and panicking and my, my brain went on autopilot and I was just running and jumping behind the tent because two people already jumped behind it. And I guess my other pilot was, was assuming those people, they already made two separate calculations that this is a good spot. Maybe. So let's just cut it short and jump there as well. <laughs> uh, so I, I basically went there, but I was behind a tent and that's not the best place to be. You want to be behind a huge rock or something like that. So then the avalanche kind of hit and um, it's more like, fine snow particles and ice particles enter your nose, your mouth. You can't breathe. I have this gigantic, I have this huge down jacket on because I was resting like a super puffy summit jacket. So I, I open it and I take my both friends underneath the jacket. So we three were under the jacket breathing there. But honestly, it felt like suffocating. Everything was getting whiter and whiter around me. And uh, I was pretty sure I'm, I'm going to die. But you didn't get completely covered, obviously. Luckily, it was only a dust avalanche. A dust avalanche is if there is more something like an explosion, a wave of this ex explosion is hitting you. And uh, I was not hit by the core material. I would not have survived that. I was only hit by the pressure wave. But that pressure wave was strong enough to kill many people kind of 
right in front of me, not far from my position. It's just been so strong that it sent objects flying, it sent people flying, it sent people flying away in their tents. Um, we had many, many injured people. It was it was serious. Yeah. So what did the hours and days after that av- avalanche look like for you? What what were you doing, and what was going on? I imagine there, you, know, you can get helicopters there. Was the weather uh, capable of? people of rescuers flying in so all helicopter flights up there are on view flights so like you can't do instrumental flights which means Mm -hmm. you you need to see where you're going and the avalanche had created such a dust cloud and clouds and stuff that there was no way of helicopters flying in there and the day was ending and there was no way of rescue and it looked like a battlefield like the middle part of the base camp it was just everything was destroyed. All the gear was laying around. All the tents were flattened. And I think an additional four people died to, due to their injuries overnight. Um, out of, I think, 63 injured, I think 16 already died in the moment the avalanche hit. Um, and then the next day, the first helicopters could arrive. I'm, I'm, we're kind of getting off topic here, but was that your closest call? In the mountains? Uh, I wouldn't say the closest, but I would say it was definitely the most intense because mm, some of the closest calls are more like, for example, I rappel. I, I solo climbed, uh, for example, I solo climbed Amadablam, which was my first mountain in the Himalayas that I did. It's uh, almost 7,000 meters tall and something like the, the Matterhorn of uh, the Himalayas. is very steep, beautiful mountain. Yeah. And uh, I was young and uh, my objective was to do a solo climb. But on the way down, uh, I was getting really tired. It was getting dark and I used some old ropes. And one of those old ropes fixed... that were already there by previous expeditions. Exactly. You have to imagine when I sold it, nobody had summited that season. So the ropes were there from minimum the previous season. Mm. And there was a lot of getting UV destroyed radiation. by snow and ice and UV. Exactly. It's high altitude, so high UV exposure. And um, I, I basically, it's more like a spider web of old ropes. And I would usually pick the best one out of five available ones, I guess. And then um, I, I would go ahead with that one. And then at one point I repelled. It's a mixed climbing section, which means it's rock and ice combined, very steep. Um, it's still above 6,000. And um, I, I just felt this kind of vibration in the rope and then I felt nothing. And it was like more kind of floating in outer space and um, kind of taking a third person perspective on you. It's like really kind of an autopilot feeling like uh, you're more observing what's going on. Like, for example, I remember at some point my crampons, they were touching the granite in front of me of all that rock that was kind of shooting up i felt like i was holding the same position but this granite was like a treadmill shooting up in front of me and my crampons were touching it and it it sprayed these sparks you know and i was thinking wow cool i've i've never seen something like this you know so like that was probably a really close call but my brain was just going into, I don't know, protection mode. So it was not felt as intense because everything happened so fast. Yeah. Well, there's panic where you're using tons of energy without accomplishing anything. And then there's reverse panic, which is almost, well, the opposite, where you, you're you not having a reaction at all commensurate with the situation. Not that there is much that you could have done in that moment. And it's interesting why and when some people go into panic versus reverse panic. Both can be good and both can be bad. But how far did you fall? Honestly, I don't know. Not so far. We're talking something like maybe eight meters or something. Like uh, it just 24 really... feet. If you land on something bad, you're you're still dead. Oh, I mean, you have to imagine still it's an 800 meter wall below me. Yeah. So I'm only falling these eight meters or this is what I guess. It just felt forever. Like when I go back into my memory, then, it just feels like this huge fall. But in reality, it was probably only something like eight yeah. meters. Um, 
like it was it was definitely long enough to have all these experiences and witness my crampons touching the rock and all that kind of Very. kind of happened all in slow motion like the frame rate of my brain was just increasing yeah. so much <laughs> Yeah, that time dilation effect is is interesting. If only we could trigger that on purpose. If you're doing a really difficult move, if you could drive that frame rate up to 300 frames per second, you could do so many cool things and make such better decisions. But maybe there's a real insanely high physiological cost for that. So uh, did you injure yourself on that fall? No, zero injuries. Mm -hmm. I clipped a second mm -hmm. rope. Um and uh just like a safe line and it's just a carabiner that is clipped into that rope there's no belay device or anything in there it just runs with me because usually those ropes are attached somewhere lower yeah, down so if i would fall i would just basically jam into that which still would would trigger an injury but it would save your life and in yeah. my case that rope was kind of cut off from that belay but it had a big knot and so i was hanging in it and it absorbed uh, the energy. Um, and uh, I remember that I had to climb up a bit before I could unclip because it was so tight from all the energy. Uh, and then I was just telling myself, look, be more careful on the next ones and keep going <laughs> and stay focused. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you are still at many thousands of meters uh, in a very cold and dangerous place. Let's go back to the West Ridge of Everest because the Hornbein Couloir has got an insane fatality rate. I mean, more people have died attempting it than have actually succeeded in doing it. I think that's still true, is it not? Look, honestly, I have no clue about the mortality rate on the Hornbein. Um, okay. There's nothing that was relevant to my research. Okay. Um, I know that there was a snowboarder who tried to snowboard it that was never Man. found after he dropped in, um, who, who died uh, in like trying to snowboard that. I know of some people who have actually climbed it and I talked to some expeditions. Oh, yeah. But right now I'm actually not aware of fatalities climbing up the Hornbein. I know at least of one who slipped in the Hornbein and fell to death, but it was on the descent. Okay. Well, still, like a couloir is kind of like, I don't know, a super steep valley, and that's going to channel all the avalanches. So you're actually deliberately climbing up an avalanche track. Is that correct? So the winter time is dry season. We're in Nepal. It's mm. a monsoon driven climate, which means there's a wet season and a dry season. The rainy season will usually start at the end of May and it will last until approximately September, um, maybe middle of September. And um, then in the winter, we're entering the dry season, which means there is not much snowfall there. There is not so yeah, much yeah. avalanche risk. What really makes this so difficult is the wind. In the winter, due to the lower temperatures, the jet stream, where usually only airplanes are cruising in, can hit the mountain and it, it hits the mountain at like up to 250 kilometers an hour. That's make yeah. that's making Everest so tricky in the winter. I remember when you were climbing up and down and up and down, and we'll get into how long you were there and how many seasons you were there, uh, finding sites that were reporting temperature and wind speed by elevation. And I'm sure this is, uh, you know, second nature to you, but to somebody who doesn't climb, it was really interesting to see how much fast, you, know, you go up a thousand meters and all of a sudden it's 20 degrees colder and the winds are going three times as fast. The, the increase in wind speed and the decrease in temperature for each increment that you went up was just crazy. So you, I could see that you were in a place where it was a little bit windy, a little bit cold, but like after a few days of watches, like, yeah, there's no way he's going to uh, go up today because you know it's 200 kilometers an hour wind exactly yeah like especially the last attempt that i had which was the winter season before the previous winter yeah. um, it was just um it was so windy from middle of january on there was a constant wind sometimes i would wait for weeks in the base camp and then i would just be like 
okay, it's it's like a little bit less now. Um, so I really want to go and see how it works. And then in the base camp, I would already lose my balance from the wind and see, and then <laughs> think, okay, maybe it's not so good to go up, you know? <laughs> so you were there for two seasons? Exactly. And how, how long were you there each time? Um, so I personally define the winter at its core. So for me, it's important to really be in the core of winter there which begins with the calendar winter on the 22nd of December, and it ends with the meteorological winter on the 28th of February. If you would okay. begin with the meteorological winter, you would start at the 1st of December, which to me is not really winter. Ski resorts usually don't open then in Europe. And uh, if yeah. you go with the calendar winter only, it would end at the 23rd of March, which 23rd of March doesn't, doesn't feel like winter to me. Um, so I'm really basically taking the most narrow definition out of the two. So uh, you might have to translate some of this into non-climber, but when you were heading up, like when you thought, maybe today I can continue, can you take us through what you were wearing and what you were carrying? How, like how much does it all weigh, but what are the, what would you take with you? I mean, every additional item is maybe useful, but also obviously weighs a, a ton so yeah all right so the the art of alpinism is to take as much as necessary but at le as little as possible basically at least in modern alpinism you uh, you don't have this um huge um machine of porters and stuff if you are a professional alpinist um and i am soloing which means i'm carrying everything on my own above the base camp there's nobody carrying anything so um i basically um have everything for with me that i need for my survival in these conditions i wear enough clothing probably already on my body like a down suit and certain layers to withstand the temperatures um and uh, a lot of the equipment is is worn already on my body uh, literally there's no single piece of skin that's exposed to the elements there. I wear goggles. I tape certain things in my face with kinesio tape that's usually used by mm -hmm. physiotherapists. I use the a stretchy, specific... The stretchy tape. Yeah, the stretchy stuff. I tape it in my face. Then um, I use uh, a certain mask uh, on my face um, so that my mouth, nose, everything's not exposed and there is a, a specific paper filter that helps me to humidify the cold air to prevent uh, coughing diseases. Um, and uh, it's also a tiny bit lower heat loss in my face. Um, so that's this layer that I'm wearing. And then in my backpack, I will have a sleeping bag, a tent. I will have gas to cook and melt snow because um, I need liquid water. Um, I have a lot of snow up there, which I can melt. It's, it's readily available. Uh, and that's also why I will not carry water up, but carry meals that are dehydrated. They're, these are like regular meals, but um, there is a chemical process called dry freezing where they um, basically take all the water out and uh, what remains is a powder. I have those with me. Um, and then I might uh, have like a headlamp with me and a shovel to create like um, little ledges um, and other climbing tools like maybe there I have a small rope but that rope is only six millimeters so it's very thin it's only for repelling it's an ultralight hyperstatic rope so it's not stretching in any way so my gear is very minimalistic all right uh ice axes obviously Carbon uh, fiber ice axes, th those are handmade. The carbon fiber is, uh, first of all, lighter, but second of all, we are dealing with extremely low temperatures. So it feels warmer to hold on to those. Mm -hmm. So how much, uh, obviously, if you're going up to establish a new camp, you're going to be carrying more stuff. But for a, a summit push, uh, how much stuff would you be carrying in addition to your own body weight? Like, what's the, what's the weight? How many kilos? So for a summit push, I sometimes don't even wear a backpack. 
you know so um you're trying to minimize as much as possible you're wearing huge boots like basically like space boots um they're already heavy then you wear a downsuit that's already weight you might wear a helmet goggles gloves all these layers you're already kind of loaded yeah. and being at high altitude generally feels like things are getting heavier you have less oxygen available you are uh, way more easy to to fatigue um so um on a let's say a normal a summit day on an 8000 meter peak i will only carry water that is inside my downsuit so it doesn't freeze and uh, maybe a few snacks but that's it i don't even eat a lot because digesting stuff is very hard in a hypoxic area and um you are like performing so hard up there that your body doesn't really take much stuff in. You don't really want to drink so no. much when you're so cold. You don't really want to eat stuff. So it's really it's really about survival on a summit day. So how do you find eating when you're not, when you're just, you know, just on the West Ridge um, and haven't headed up to above, uh, you know, 7,000 meters and up? You were there for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. How did you find the eating and drinking there? Was there any problem? Absolutely not. But sometimes no, I did have some stomach issues. Most of those are really like hygiene based. Like um, the base camp that I stay is not so hygienic. Like um, I basically stay in a village in in uh, Nepal there. And um, it's kind of like, uh, how do I say... Um, we carry a lot of the foods over huge distances, so it's not all perfect. Um, and so I do have often I have stomach issues. And so, for example, on one expedition, I ended up uh, doing some fasting for like two days up in high altitude because my stomach wasn't feeling so right, and and I was uh, not eating anything basically. <laughs> but yeah. most of the time, I love eating. Well, working as can, can working eat. insanely hard. While and your body's working hard to keep you warm, and must it be losing weight at a ridiculous at a ridiculous rate? Um, so here's the funny thing: the first expedition I did to Everest I actually gained weight. Really? Because in the base camp I was eating all that stuff. I was eating a lot, um, and then I was going on the mountain, and and there was not so much oxygen, so my body had a hard time burning all the fat because burning fat needs oxygen so instead it burned my muscles which are more easily available <laughs> it okay. basically digested the muscles that i used the most and left the fat so when i came back home i had more fat than before <laughs> <laughs> well maybe spending all that time in the cold has made you more like a polar bear i know if a polar bear eats like a uh, one unit of fat, it can convert 90% of it to its own body fat. So if it find it, it's they're incredibly efficient at eating fat and turning fat into fat on their bodies. So maybe that cold, uh, that cold weather has made you partially a polar bear. And, uh, uh I mean, yeah, the thing is, I, I do talk to polar explorers. Some of my friends uh, are like, um, really accomplished polar explorers. And um, they have to eat or they do eat completely different for their expeditions yeah. than I do eat for high altitude. The altitude yeah. changes a lot in the diet and it becomes really, really hard to digest fats. Like, for example, if you eat a few nuts or something like uh, meat, meat is also pretty, pretty heavy to digest. That can stay in your stomach for quite a while and it can feel quite heavy and, and uh, just stay in there. Well, if you would do that in a polar environment, in low altitude, yeah. but extremely low temperatures, that's perfect fuel. Well, when Malakov and Weber went to the North Pole uh, and back, self-supported, I think their 80 or 90% of their calories were coming from fat. It was the ultimate uh, ketogenic diet. It's actually something I experimented with before a longer canoe expedition. Um, I wanted to see if fat and oil could could replace it because it's so much more energy per unit weight and I would have to carry about half the weight of food. So I did a one-month experiment 
uh, at home and I did blood work before and I did blood work after. And it turns out that I'm one of those, I don't know, roughly 25% of people who's just not at all designed for keto. I, my every single blood lipid value went the wrong way. My HDL went through the roof. My LD, sorry, my HDL collapsed. My H LDL went through the roof. All the ratios were off. And my doctor called me and like, you have to stop. You're going to die. I like, I know I looked at the blood work. I've stopped already. So I, I don't think, although I like the Arctic, I don't think I would do very well in the polar regions. What are you eating? You're mostly eating simple carbohydrates. So uh, first of all, I do believe it's trainable. I do believe it Man. just takes time to adjust your body. And especially with fatty diets, if you eat too much fat, uh, for example, on expeditions like in the Arctic, um, uh, it can happen that even very seasoned people, um, their stomach rejects it and you have to reduce the amount of, of fats. Um, but I actually do... Um, uh, how do I say? I'm on a vegan diet. Vegan diet, so really? um, that means uh, vegans in general um, take the lowest amount of fat in their in the daily diet. Like the kinds of fats that I would eat is basically like oils, like olive oil, coconut oil, nuts, um, all that stuff. Just but um, naturally, by being a vegan, I, I have a low fat diet, so that works really well for me in high altitude. Um, Why are you a vegan? Is it health or conscience? It's or because I believe it's it's the best performing diet for me. Um, I um, I did some paleo before, um, and uh, the whole idea of paleo was basically uh, let's try to feed the body what it's like been eating for most of its evolutionary life. Um, but then latest evidence came out uh, analyzing some micro fossils, plant fossils, and they realized that the paleo diet kind of got it a bit wrong because it's based on all this evidence that was found earlier when people just found the bones and the tools and they thought yes. people had been primarily eating meat. And so, um, I mean, the whole idea is um, that people had been eating more plants before and then only for a very, very short amount of time, people have been domesticating animals, therefore using milk products and stuff. Um, is is only a, over a short period, and so, I mean, um, at least for myself, I um, have less inflammatory responses, and um, it's not like a magic thing that's just going to change your life overnight. It's just. I can say now that after doing it a couple of years, it feels good for me. I can perform with this. I do check my markers. I do blood work. And this is something that works for me. It might not work for everybody, but it works for me. And then that's the most important thing in this case. Well, I, I have played with a vegan diet as well. And for me, the main thing that stopped it was just the extra amount of time. Uh, it, it, you have to be much more deliberate and you have to be much more careful and you run into, you know, vegans or vegetarians once in a while who, you know, I'm a vegetarian, therefore I only eat cheese pizza. It's like, no, no. <laughs> um, you know, or they get it. They, they don't have, I had a friend once, uh, we went out for pizza and uh, they didn't have cheese pizza. So he got a vegetable pizza and he picked all the vegetables off of it before eating it. And he was a vegetarian. It's like, I, I don't think you're doing this diet correctly. I mean, so. the good thing about it is whatever diet you're on it's increasing your consciousness and especially being a vegan um, I'm very conscious about what I buy and therefore many vegan products are not available in a highly processed format so I end up buying the raw ingredients which I do believe is the best solution I'm also one of these whole food uh, vegans so I, I do believe in unprocessed foods and um, I'm just basically trying to, to have the lowest amount of processing. I, I don't eat refined sugars, for example. Um, and yes, it's work in the beginning, but then once you build a routine, it's just following the routine. How do you do it in the uh, Nepalese or Himalayan villages? Because, you know, with yak, I mean, yes, they have vegetarian components, but there's a, a lot of uh, dairy, I believe, in, in their diet, isn't there? 
Um, so I basically uh, can order a lot of vegan meals. Um, yeah. And uh, animal products, especially in high altitude, are are expensive and and rare, um, and they have to be brought there. Like imagine you eating eggs there; they have to come from somewhere. It's usually not not uh, how do I say done very hygienically. Or if you want to eat meat in a, a Buddhist high altitude area, like for example in Everest, this um, meat um, essentially has to travel a very long way because in Buddhism, like in these Buddhist areas, animals are not killed. So that means they have to be killed somewhere else and then carried there. Um, so in generally, um, it's very easy to be on a vegan diet in Nepal. And also, no. um, I had a cook joining me for um, many years uh, that could, for example, do vegan burgers, uh, hmm. could do vegan cookies and all that kind of stuff. And vegan pa apple pancakes uh, for breakfast and so on so he was supporting me um by just being in the in the base camp and and cooking really good stuff okay unfortunately that cook um died last year um well no guiding on an 8000 meter peak um so um yeah i mean uh co being confronted with yeah uh death is definitely something that that happens a lot in and the stuff that I do. Yeah. So how do you deal with it? Um, do you like split it off and keep it in one part of your mind while you're focusing on the task at hand in a different part of your mind? Or or how do you navigate a, a landscape where there is quite a lot of death, where you know, certainly every mountaineer knows uh, multiple handfuls of people who have died while pursuing their sport um how do you handle that so i usually try to learn something from their death like um i mean even if the circumstances are most of the time not so clear there is one simple message and that is be more careful because this could happen to yourself as well like uh um, be more focused and um, I mean usually there is this short moment where I feel emotionally impacted especially if it's close friends um, and um, yes it's another reminder to be more careful but um, I think for me it's important to allow myself this short moment to grieve and um and then it's also for it's also very important that I quickly compartmentalize it, okay. put it in a place um, that that basically doesn't affect me emotionally, so that I can keep doing my job. Um, and I think I'm I'm very good at that. Um, but in order for that to work, it's important to first allow all feelings to happen, and then uh, understand as much as you can why it happened. Then I try to learn from it. And then, of course, I mean, we we basically go into the mountains because we seek that risk, but we seek to survive it. We're endangering yeah. ourselves, uh, like, uh, to come out uh, well. That's the paradox of alpinism. And it's it's part of the game. And, and I do that myself. And... Um, I don't believe it's right to say that, yeah, but he died at least while he was doing what he loved. No, he basically did a mistake and he failed. And uh, we want to survive. The goal is to survive. But in all dangerous environments, yes, there are mistakes that you can make. And then there's just stuff that nature throws at you and... Uh, that, that you can't really account for. I mean, in my case, if I'm out in the middle of a, a lake and a freak uh, wind comes up, yes, maybe I shouldn't have been out in the middle of the lake in a canoe, but on the other hand, if I always 10 feet from shore, I'm never going to get to where I'm going. So, and in your case, I mean, a, an avalanche can happen. Um, and true. so how, how much... 
How do you think about the risks that you can control versus the risks that are a lot more uncontrollable that you just have to accept, I guess, if you're in that environment? I mean, yes, there are always these objective risks that you can only control in one way or in a few ways, let's say. So, for example, if there is um, a risk of a strong wind on the middle of the lake for your canoe, once you gain more experience, you can actually make observations that will show you, okay, look, there is something, there is a high risk situation now. Let's paddle a little bit faster to minimize my yeah. exposure. It's the same in alpinism. Once you do have a certain level of experience, you have a better awareness for the reality, for the risk that awaits you, which means I, for example, um, divide the project into different sections with different risk factors. High risk factors are areas where I move very fast to minimize my exposure. Then there are zero risk areas. That's where I put my camps or rest or recharge or listen to a podcast while I'm mountaineering. And then there's this orange in between area. It's neither green nor red. It's the area where you're tense, you're focused, you remind yourself of the risks. So, so you kind of stay aware for things to happen. But even like, so this is one thing to do. The other thing is, for example, to, to decide um, that uh, this is not a project that is worth pursuing in general. Maybe hey. stay home, stay in a safe environment and take your one shot for something very meaningful and expose yourself to risk there where you feel like this is important to you and it's more about quality than quantity. So this is just basically um, having statistics work for you. And of course, there is always this tiny, tiny chance that even though you work in this way and you minimize everything, something can go wrong. And that's the adventure. And as paradox as it sounds, alpinists, I, people that go in the mountains, people that push for 8,000 meter peaks for these extreme things, um, they do it because they know there is this tiny chance that things can go wrong because then it's an adventure. It's a journey into the unknown. Of course, we don't want to be the fatalities. Yes. But we want to um, feel alive and, and master survival. So let's go back to Everest again, like, since that's kind of been the touchstone here. The route that you were planning on, can you talk about sort of this idea of, I don't know, did you say green, orange, red, or the low risk, medium risk, high risk? What what would have been the stratification of the parts you were climbing um, that way? And how did you think about it on that particular climb? All right. So I would say that right in the beginning, the route starts all like in the base camp itself, it's safe. But then when you approach, you're approaching through an avalanche cone. That's like an area where avalanches come down and they build this kind of pile of snow. You're walking on that. That's definitely not good, you know, mm. like because you're walking up where avalanches come down frequently. Yeah. You're walking below a huge serac. So the route starts off right in the red zone which means I need to move fast there and I need to take certain actions that in case something triggers, I can evade the, the danger. I can uh, run to a certain angle where um, that avalanche would not hit me because that avalanche that comes down there is uh, an ice avalanche that is triggered by a serac. A serac is a glacier that is falling off a cliff so there is a glacier above that is slowly moving over this cliff and sometimes stuff breaks loose and falls down through a chute and my route basically is on the bottom of that chute. So um, the approach is in the red, but then I will be at a cliff that is overhanging and protected. It's more like orange because some stuff can fall out of the cliff because it's not so good rock quality, but the avalanches can't hit me. Then once I reach the good quality part of the cliff, I'm in the green zone. Theoretically, 
nothing can really hit me there, even though a big avalanche has come down, comes down, then, I mean, I'm going again in a little bit of orange uh, as I'm approaching again, crossing over the chute where the avalanches could come down, then it's highly red. It's dark red because I'm traversing through an area, but luckily from that perspective, I can see what's going on above and I need only one minute 30 to, to skip it. And I think it needs at least a minute for the avalanche to reach it there. So kind of You could even turn back if you had to for the first 30 seconds. Yeah, turning back usually I... takes the momentum, so I'd probably just push on. Um, and um, I mean, so just to give you an idea, this is the beginning of the route. You're entering steep rock climbing there. Um, and um, then the higher up I go on the mountain, the lower the objective risk. If I reach 6,000 meters, a lot of the objective risk is already canceled out. Really? Now I have other risks. I move higher. I have, of course, high altitude exposure and I have weather exposure. But that is something that's a bit more predictable, that happens slower. Um, so the, in terms of objective danger, the beginning of the route is kind of a nightmare. And then it kind of eases off a bit. Uh, and then you depend more on skill and you can take more influence on, on the outcome. The low oxygen aspect of this is really incredible to me. I, here at sea level, there are various, we're at 20.8% oxygen. And of course, on top of Everest, it's still 20.8% oxygen, but Correct. it's just so much more diffuse. It's almost as if it's like, I forget what it is, like 5% oxygen or 6% oxygen. It's the equivalent of being in a room where they pump most of the oxygen. At sea level, if, if we're working in a factory and there's a process that uses up oxygen and we go below 19.5, at that point, in, at least in Canada and the United States, the regulators freak out. They, they say that below 19.5% oxygen, uh, your mental <laughs> processes are impaired, therefore you're not going to be making safe decisions and you need to take measures. You cannot go below 19.5 by law. And you're not only below 19 and a half. You're not only below 50. <laughs> I, most normal people would pass out at somewhere between 10 and 15% and you're equivalent, uh, equivalent of, and you're well below that. I mean, obviously there's a climatization, but do you think that you're gifted in some way to be able to function at that low oxygen level or is that mostly training or genetic? Like what's the genetics versus training versus time, uh, Algebra uh, for that. All right. So genetics wise, there are so-called non-responders. Those are people that do not acclimatize and they can already feel pretty bad at like 2,500 meters of elevation. Um, so I'm only genetically gifted in the way that I'm not a non-responder, but otherwise, I mean, I never done a specific genetic test to say, I don't know if I'm gifted or something. Um, I personally do not believe in this kind of being gifted philosophy. I believe in building skill. I mean, my generation, I grew up with all these kind of superheroes like Spider-Man, for example, that are normal dudes. And then they're bitten by a radioactive spider and they turn into somebody awesome. Um, but I, I think that the older days when people watched movies like Rocky, well, Rocky is this uh, boxer that gets the opportunity to to fight against the, the world champion. Uh, suddenly, he knows he's not ready. He needs to become somebody. He needs to build skill. And then you see all these training uh, sequences where he just trains crazy and he becomes somebody. I believe more into that, you know? So, so I don't believe... I'm not Spider-Man. I'm definitely not Spider-Man. I believe I'm I'm more Rocky or Batman, you know? Normal dudes that build skill... And um, of course, there are people like the Sherpa that have lived over generations and generations in high altitude, and they they are genetically gifted. Um, so I might be somewhere in the middle of that, but I would still say there is so much you can do with building skill, with acclimatizing rights. If like 
when I acclimatize, I acclimatize very intensely. Um, for example, um, the amount of red blood cells that I had in my body was reaching 55%. My normal level is around 41 to 43%. If you have 50.1%, you are disqualified by any sport that does doping tests. Yeah. Because you're already too high. You're already at a high level that is so high you can you can risk thrombosis and so on. So they assume that you're taking EPO or, or something like it. Exactly. Or that you had a blood transfusion where you were just uh, pumping your own red blood cells into your system. That happens naturally for me up there. So I drink like five, six liters per day easily to keep the blood liquid. Um, like really hydrate a lot, of course, in the base camp. Then when you're on the mountain, you're constantly dehydrated because it's so difficult to drink enough. Yeah. But so there is so much um, strategy, there's so much tactics, like, um, for example, the altitude um, affects you with a certain delay and so on. If you move with greater speed, you can take advantages of that. But of course, you can't move too fast because then you use up too much, too much oxygen and you get your system into so critical thresholds before... And then, of course, you're like you're absolutely right. You're in this like deathly like environment. It's a it's an ice desert. You can rarely breathe, and now maybe something goes wrong, and you need to take a, maybe a a life or death decision. That's like trying to solve a mathematical problem when you're drunk. You know, no. if the problem is easy enough, you you can figure it out. But once it gets very complex. Um, it's very difficult to calculate it precisely. So here I would argue that it's very important to rely on experience and um, use something that I would call big data. It's like um, relying on your intuition because there's so much going on that you can't consciously process this anymore. And if I don't have a good feeling about this, then there is a reason for it. And it's somehow... I can't describe it to you because I'm doing this for so many years. It's like I've become the skill. Um, so it's like um, at a certain stage in the expedition, I just know, I just know I can't go any further. And there is no discussion in my mind. It's just this, it's like when you know you're dreaming, you know, you're not like, maybe I'm dreaming 50%. You know, for sure you're dreaming. And um and it's like that. I know for sure this is the limit. I have to turn around now. Now, then there is the point where you can say, I don't accept this limit and I want to push further because of, I don't know, extrinsic motivations, a sponsor that promised a bonus or whatever. That's something that I'm very well and very able to um, to control because ultimately the the really good thing about what I do is it's my job. That means I have many opportunities to do it. Yeah. Uh, I did not invest my life savings and uh, three years of holidays into the project. If it doesn't work, I'll just come back another time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think what you're, if I understand what you're saying correctly, you're saying that the what you call big data, which is all of your personal experience and all everything that you've read and everybody you've talked to and all the accidents that you've heard about and you've learned from that that's all the data but then after you're in the flow of the expedition and you make these intuitive decisions you're actually your brain in some way is processing all this data along with the, the information that you're getting about your body and the environment and the decision is pretty obvious did i did i understand mm -hmm. that correctly yes plus it also processes of course all uh, information on the expedition like yeah. what was the temperature like how much snow did fall what are the ice conditions uh, how much wind is there right now what did the report say for the next three weeks uh, what did the report say for tomorrow it's just basically all that data goes together and of course when i'm in a break i process the data i think yeah. about it i make strategies i make plans but when you take the very big important decisions out there 
and things go wrong, stuff does not go according to plan, then I really rely on this big data because I have to take a decision very fast and I can't consciously process all that information that goes into the decision. And so therefore I rely on big data basically. Yes. Just to jump back one step as we're wrapping up here, uh, you talked about uh, training and you talked about acclimatization and being intelligent in your decisions around hypoxia. What are you, when you're at home in Germany, when you're uh, living in Italy, when you're in Europe, basically at sea level, uh, how are you training for the hypoxia that you know you're going to face in the future? So, um, and mountaineering, especially like climbing 8,000 meter peaks is a low intensity workout. Your heart rate doesn't go up very high. Um, and it's going to last for hours and hours and hours for days, months. Uh, it's, it's going to take time. So, um, it's, um, it's really important to focus on level one endurance. Uh, where that is a low intensity workout for many hours. So that is the base of my training. So what does that look like? Does that look like long mountain hikes or biking or uh, skiing? Or uh, what does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis when you're not injured? All right. So for me, it's very... Um, it's very nice to see new places. I already mentioned I like to explore. And so, um, of course, the best uh, training uh, to to go up in high altitude with a heavy backpack on your back is to, to do elevation gain with some weight on your back. And um, I do live in the French Alps in front of Mont Blanc. So there are many mountains right in front of my door or I could just go up and uh, basically carry stuff up there. Often I carry a paraglider up there and then just fly down. So it's a good combination. And then um, I often go to places that are tricky to fly. So there's a high chance I'm also carrying the glider down, which is also good training. But then I still get the chance to maybe fly. Um, but then I also really like to climb peaks in the Alps uh, all over just so my the base of my training would basically to climb as many peaks as possible, have nice mountain days out. Um, it can be climbing many different 4,000 meter peaks, but uh, it doesn't have to be. There is um, the idea of prominence. Prominence is the independence of a summit. So when you are on a summit and you can look down on all sides and you have a 360 degrees uh, panoramic view, then it's a very prominent peak. And I have this map in my bedroom of the 1,000 prominent peaks of the Alps. So whenever I'm in base training, I'll just try to climb as many of those, see new places, go new places, and just do lots of volume training. And now it's important. I, I don't only do the volume. That's very important. But then sometimes I do like once a week a session that's a bit faster. Um, uh, Zone two uh, so or three? Uh, like more three zone two is more like no man's land. If you're in zone two, then it's just like, basically most often the result will be like zone one, but the fatigue will almost be like zone three kind of like, it's just, you get more fatigue, but not the result you're looking for. I, I would do something like a max average training, which means I just try to reach the summit as fast as possible. And therefore I need to have a very good average speed in order to, to yeah. do it. Uh, that's more something like a once a week quality session. And then, of course, there's strength training. There's a, a minimum of two times per week strength training because strength training is important for the power, like to go up and to be stronger. But it's also very important to stay free of injuries. Um, strength training is kind of like preventing um, damage to your body, just get, get stronger material there. And, and then of course there, there are two active rest days per week. Yeah. I, I think strength training, I mean, paradoxically it, it can cause injuries, 
But on the other hand, it's probably the single biggest thing that you can do to prevent injuries, especially when you're either doing a sport that has incredible amounts of repetition, or as you get older, uh, uh, in your in your early 20s, you can get away with training like crap and still performing at a high level. But as you get older, if you want any kind of functionality at all, you better be doing some strength training. And, and I imagine to, to try and balance out your body, if you're always doing one motion, you're going to develop deficits and bad postural habits. I, I like, uh, I don't know, the, the best posture for, for being a Tour de France cyclist is not good for your back. So you should try and balance that out a little bit. Absolutely. And that's why I do work with physiotherapists, osteopaths, chiropractors um, on a regular basis. And um, I have sports massage on a regular basis. Um, but even doing that, sometimes I do explore the limits of my own body. It's natural Good. because I try to perform in the top range. So I naturally push my body um, to the limit and then sometimes slightly above the limit and then you get some backlash and that's how you learn and that's how you see your weaknesses as an, as an athlete. That's absolutely normal. Um, and then it's really important to take that feedback and work on those weaknesses to develop further. And then you might realize that next time you're stronger, the weakness will appear somewhere else. So it's always keeping this very tricky balance. And I'm essentially so like like a triathlete or like a like a almost like somebody who's doing a decathlon. You know, like there are so many disciplines. I do climbing, ice climbing. Um, I do mountaineering, um, but then again, I I might, I don't know, do a ski approach or paraglide yeah. somewhere. Um, all these are tools to do the alpinism that I do. And then in high altitude mountaineering, you need a lot of tools uh, because you don't know what to expect. Ah, okay, there's a section with rock and ice combined. So, of course, you need to be ready and you need to be above average in all those disciplines. And you're always going to be lagging behind in one of them. You're going to be, man, my, I'm, I'm putting words in your mouth, but I know this is true from every other activity. My ice climbing is totally on point right now, but my rock climbing sucks. Or uh, my, I'm so strong right now, but my endurance isn't quite where I want it to be. There's always going to be one area that's lagging behind because you can't be perfectly tuned up at every single area in a multidisciplinary sport all at the same time. You can be above average, but you might not be best in the world at all the 10 different areas. Exactly. For me, it's usually like if you're good at ice climbing, it's upper body strength. It's also quite good for climbing. But for me, it's really to decide, okay, this season it's upper body or lower body. So do I want to climb something really, really hard and technical? Or do I want to climb something really, really high and fast maybe? Uh, yeah. So Everest, the project is very technical. But it's still something that mainly relies on my engine, on my endurance. Um, yes, I need to climb stuff, but um, I'm on the climbing level where that stuff is very manageable for me. And even if I don't train it much, it goes automatically. But now if I would climb, I don't know, a an alpine rock face that is very steep, then training for Everest and training for that very steep climbing route it's completely different training. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to conclude with, I'm sure, the same question that everybody asks, but that's only because everybody wants to know it. Um, what are your plans for the immediate future? I mean, you tried your insane solo uh, winter, no oxygen Everest route on the highest, well, on the highest mountain in the world uh, for two seasons and didn't succeed. Are you going back? And what other projects do you have on the sort of on your wall or, you know, in, in flag mentally as something you'd like to try someday? I'm definitely going back. And um, I think my mentality right now is to really just focus on that project. Don't get distracted. Um, by other projects, um, it's so easy. I do have projects that are like training objectives, like climbing these yeah. peaks in the Alps, but that's really just training. That's something that's really enjoyable doing with friends or maybe just going there 
but it's just different. It's just pure pleasure almost, you know? <laughs> and of course, I'm getting strong doing this for the higher purpose. Um, and um, I was going to attempt Everest this coming winter, actually, until I um, basically uh, hit... Uh, I don't know. How do you say that in English? I hit a, a wall. <laughs> yeah. um, so I was in peak shape. I did a final training um, climbing Mont Blanc over the Royal uh, Traverse. It's a really long, beautiful traverse uh, going to like from one side of Mont Blanc over a couple of peaks and then uh, down on the other side over a couple of peaks. Um, and on the summit day, I, um, I was in a lot of pain. Um, it was like my right leg that, that was hurting. That's, this is really like happening absolutely recently. Like right now I'm in Italy sitting here right now at this sofa because of that, basically, because it turned out that, um, uh, I actually, from all these training hours on my legs, I put a lot of pressure on my hip area and mm -hmm. that put a lot of pressure on my lower back and I injured myself. Um, and um, it's basically, um, how do I say, um, it, as hard as it sounds, I, I just needed to step back and say, okay, shit, this project this winter is it's not going to work. I planned out everything, you know. I was oh, no. like, as we are talking right now, just before we recorded this podcast, I sent a weather report to an expedition. I should have been on that expedition because it oh, was my no. acclimatization for Everest. <sighs> and so um, they went without me. Um, I, uh, I do coaching um, with the Altitude Academy. It's an academy that I built to teach people skills via altitude mountaineering. And there are six people that depend on me, kind of, and they... They had to go without me and I had to find a replacement for me to replace me on the expedition. I'm still right now che checking their satellite position and setting them weather updates and inputs and talking through the acclimatization strategies and so on. Um, but I imagine this completely different. Ideally, we would not have had this conversation right now. I would be yes. <laughs> out in yeah. Himalaya saying, sorry, I'm not available. Uh, but um, I actually pushed really hard and biomechanically my body went into certain habits and positions just as you said a few minutes earlier and uh, I um, I felt the consequences and now I'm in rehab mode uh, it's going to take me approximately uh, two to three months to be back uh, in normal training and that's exactly when the season will be over and uh, this is an important lesson for me because this just highlights again how important it is to do the right strength training, to work with the right professionals, and um, to do the homework and be stronger. And now I think I'm going to be a stronger athlete after that. And I'm already so stoked to like uh, go back to Everest after that and uh, hopefully be much stronger um, than I would have been this season. Yeah. I'm I'm very sorry that happened. On the other hand, it does seem like you've taken this and kind of taken the best possible lesson from it. So I wish you luck in maybe not this season, but I wish you luck in your rehab currently and in your many active seasons to come. So how how do people follow these expeditions? And I guess now if your rehab and your your time in the mountains, what what are the best ways for people to do that? Hmm. So my expeditions are easily followed on my website, joostkobusch.com. Um, Maybe spell that for people. Ah, so it's J-O-S-T, like my name, basically. And then my last name is K-O-B-U-S-C-H. Um, and uh, there is a newsroom where there is a live tracking. So if you want to see what the... Himlung, the 7,000 meter expedition is up to right now that I'm remotely coaching at the moment. <laughs> uh, you can see it there. There are usually updates or there's a 3D live tracking there when I'm on Everest. 
or uh, when I climbed mountains like Denali, uh, which I did by the beginning of this year. All this stuff you can find on my website. Um, there is also an easy way to reach out to me. Send me an email if you have questions. Otherwise, Instagram. Um, I'm pretty active on Instagram. And you mentioned to follow my recovery. My initial, my initial reaction right now is more like, oh no, I don't know really if I want to post anything because recovering is so boring, you know? It's just like... Um, Everybody so gets injured. Everybody gets injured. That's useful. Uh, that's actually super useful information for people. For one, it, it stops them from getting discouraged when they get injured. Number two, they see how a, a professional does it. I think it's incredibly useful. So maybe you convinced me today to put some recovery information, pictures and stuff on my Instagram as well, um, which is a good way to follow me. It's just my name, type in my name and you will you will find it. I'm sure there will be links and stuff in the show notes as usual, yeah, I guess. 100%. Yeah, 100%. Well, Joost, thank you so much for joining us. I really enjoyed this and I'm going to enjoy following uh, your recovery and your <laughs> adventures for a Bye, long time. Uh,